our prayers are basically giving permission to god to come into our life and intervene in our life in the affairs of our life to do what he wants to do in our life i love you i love you i love you lord today because you care for me in such a special way and yes i praise you i lift you up and i magnify your name that is why my heart is filled with praise say it out i love you i love I did not come into this world naked. Not naked in the sense that this man is talking about. I came naked, I returned naked because he lost his children, he lost his cattle, he lost everything. So he's saying, I have nothing. I came with nothing. I'm going back with nothing. I wouldn't say that because it is not true. I came rich with a rich deposit of God's gifts and God's purpose in my life. And every one of you the same way. Is it true that we go back naked? It is not true also. Revelation 14:13 says, "Blessed are those that are dead in Christ. They cease from their labors and they enter into their rest, and their works do follow them." Have you ever read that? Their works do follow them for many years they told me, "What are you going to take when you go?" And I believe these guys. So I'm now careful whenever they say something like this. Especially some people when they preach, I'm very careful. Is it in the Bible? They always say 
It doesn't matter what you have or don't have because you're not going to take anything anyway. So I never bothered about being very successful, being very effective, using my abilities for God and doing something useful and productive. All of that didn't mean anything because what am I going to take? What is the use of being a successful person in this world? Am I going to take anything? What if I earned a lot and did well and all? If I, am I going to take anything? They convinced me that I'm not going to take anything. So it doesn't matter. No motivation to live successfully. But then I found out that my works do follow me. That means it is important that I use every minute, every day, every year of life productively, fruitfully, produce something in this world and everything that God has given me in every way. In every way, including my years of life in this, in, in this world. Everything that, is God, that God has given me, I'm, I'm accountable for it. Every gift, I'm accountable to it, to it. Every money that God has given me, I'm accountable to God for it. Because I need to use it for God's glory to do God's will and fulfill His purpose and mission in my life. I got to do it. So everything all of a sudden began to make sense to me. Why? I've been given so much. Like the Bible says, to him much, to, to whom much is given, much is required. So it is true. If you're given much, much is required. You're supposed to do a lot for God. And I feel that obligation. And everything makes, makes sense to me. I don't say that anymore. I don't say things like, you know, what is the use? What, you know, what does it matter what we have or how, you know, successful we are or not, you know, it doesn't matter because when we go, we are not going to take anything. I don't believe that. I want to be successful. I must be successful. I want to be fruitful. I want to be victorious in this life. I want to do something effective. I want to fulfill God's mission in my life so that one day when I finish my life on this earth, I am not going to go empty handed before God. I'm going to go packed with tons and tons of stuff of the works that I have done, that I have been called to do and appointed to do, assigned to do. See, now everything makes sense. Your wealth makes sense. Your brilliance makes sense. Your gifts make sense. If you can sing, if you can play music, if you can do this, that, everything makes sense. You've been given that by God. You better find out why you've been given that by God and begin to use that for some of your businessmen, some of your teachers, lawyers, doctors, and, and so on. You've been given certain gifts by God. And it's your, your, you, you are to be, you are to be accountable before God. One day when you stand, I tell you, my friend, you're going to go with your works before God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, he has recreated us in Christ Jesus. Why? so that we may do the works that he has planned even before the world began. What an amazing verse. He saved us. Why? So that we may do the works that he has appointed for us to do or meant for us to do even before the world began. So the fact that we came naked, I mean, the, the, the statement that we came naked and go back naked is wrong. We don't come naked we don't go back naked also. We come loaded and we go back loaded. You can write it right next to it. That's the truth. Job said this, but what Job said is not the truth. Even the statement, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, it's become such an important, such a very famous statement. Anything bad happens, somebody shows up in our house and say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, you know. That's the thing that you hear every, every time when, 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 when something is going on, you know, bad. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. How convenient, you know. But it's not the Lord who's giving, who's, who's taking away. The Lord is a giver. That's what the book of Job is all about. The Lord didn't do anything bad. Then why did Job say something like this? Why did Job say the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away? Why did Job say I came naked, I'm going back naked? Because... Job did not have the Bible. He didn't have the Old Testament or the New Testament. He didn't have a church. He didn't have a teaching ministry to teach him. He did not have all these aids that we have today. Even with all these aids today, with Bible, with church, with preachers around, still people are saying, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. 
And that poor guy, Job, didn't have nothing. He didn't have a church. He didn't have the Bible. He didn't have nothing. If he had the Bible, he would have read something like this, something like James chapter 1, verse 13. Look at that. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. <laughs> My friends, when you're tempted with evil and something bad is going on, a lot of people say, why is God tempting me like this? Don't say that you're tempted by God. God is not tempted by evil. Neither does he tempt anyone with evil. So if something evil is happening in your life, do not ever turn around and say, why is God tempting me? Don't say that, it says. Why? Because God is not tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man with evil. <laughs> what a great truth here. But Job didn't know that. Verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Now notice this. Every good gift and every perfect gift. It could have said every good and perfect gift, but it says every good gift and every perfect gift. The emphasis is upon the good gift and the perfect gift. If something is happening in your life which is very good, positive, and very perfect, Perfect. How many of you said about something that's happened to your, happening in your life? Perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Some blessing comes along your way and you say, perfect. Something comes in your way and you say, good. Every good and perfect gift comes from where? Is from above. And comes down from the Father. In Tamil Bible it says, it not, doesn't say just from above, it says, it is made from above or it is created from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no uh, variation or shadow of turning. So in heaven, there is nothing evil. So if some evil comes, it could not have come from heaven. Heaven has no evil. Heaven has nothing negative. Heaven has everything good. Heaven knows no problem. Heaven is where everything is good and perfect. Only good and perfect things are made in heaven. If there is bad and imperfect things happening here, it is not coming from heaven. It is from coming from somewhere else. It is not from heaven. Only good and perfect gifts come from God. Hello. <laughs> Only good and perfect gifts come from God. Job didn't know that. Job had no idea of these truths. We have an idea of these things today, but Job never knew all of these things. So what was going on with Job's life? Read, read Job chapter 3, verse 25. There is a clue to what was going on. Verse 25, For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. Me. What I feared has come upon me, what I dreaded has happened to me. Now, it seems like to me that this good man, this upright man, this man blameless, who shunned evil and feared God, what a nice man, had something wrong going on, I said, for all of this to come about. And what was wrong? The thing is, this good man was afraid. There was some negativity in his life. He has allowed fear to come into his life. He, does not he has not understood that fear is an evil thing, that fear is the door of entry for the devil. Through fear, the devil comes in. He does not understand that. He fears, and the Bible says every day he was offering sacrifices because he was afraid that one of his ten children would have sinned or done something wrong and something bad is going to happen to him. He's always thinking, he's got a negative idea about God, that God is going to come down with a great punishment and do away with him and take away everything that he's got or something like that. He was afraid all the time, afraid of God, afraid some evil might happen. So the thing that I feared greatly has come upon me, he says. 
Now, if he feared greatly, that means he has been fearing it and he has been speaking it. He has been thinking it and speaking it. And that is why this thing has entered. See, the Bible says that God put a hedge around about him. When we read chapter 1 verse 8 to 10, it says God not only blessed him, but put a hedge around him. So that what he has given him will be protected. Do you know that when God created man, with every man, God not only blessed man, but has given a hedge or provided a hedge of protection for man, in man himself. In the Garden of Eden, there was no compound walls, there was no gate. Only after Adam sinned, God sent him out of the garden, had to put, a, put angelic beings as gods to guard the way to the tree of life. But before that, there was no, there was no compound wall, there was no gate, there was no angel standing there guarding the garden or anything like that. But God told Adam, guard it. He did say to Adam, guard it. That means there is an evil one out there. He will try to come in. He will try to get in. Guard it. How does he, how should he guard it? Where is the hedge? Where is the protection? And just a compound wall is not enough because the devil is a spirit being. A compound wall is not enough. Just a gate is not enough. Right? How would he protect? How would, uh, what kind of hedge would he have? God has given man one most wonderful hedge. You know what that is? That is man's mind and man's mouth. Man is very special. In what way is he special? He's special in the sense that man has the ability to think, analyze, decide, and, uh, think, analyze, determine, and decide. It's talking about the will of man. How many of you understand that the will, the ability to will something, to determine something, is a very special thing that God has given to us mentally. It is something that is very special and precious. That you and I can think about things, analyze things, determine things, and decide on things. And say, this is what I will be. This is what I want to have. This is what I will achieve. This is what I want to have. That ability, some people don't appreciate it because they don't appreciate the Bible and the truth that it's saying. It has been given as a hedge, like a compound wall, like a fence around man. In the mind of man, God has put a hedge. This will serve as a hedge to keep the devil out. Because when you decide and determine what you will have for your life, when you take God's will and say, Lord, not my will, but your will will be my will. I take your will and I decide that what you want in my life is the thing that will happen. When you decide like that, when you determine something like that, you are raising the hedge so that other things that is contrary to the will of God and your will which is in line with God's will cannot enter in. That's the hedge. Hope you're thinking with me. The other thing is the mouth. The mind and the mouth. This is the hedge. If the mind is like the compound wall, the mouth is like the door or gate, I would say. Compound wall with the gate. The mouth is like very important. When you're speaking, many times it's because your mind is already absorbed it and as a result you're beginning to, beginning to speak. And you got to be careful because this is something with which you can open the door of your life to wrong things. God has given this to man so that even if God wanted to enter into our lives and do something, he's got to come in crossing that hedge. God has given this hedge for man, the boundaries, the, the compound wall and the gate. So if God wants to do something in my life, he doesn't come and thrust it into my life. He doesn't come and push his will on me. He never does that. That's why we have a verse like this in Revelation 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, I will enter in. I will come in and I will sup with him and he with me. Right? Why, is, why does he have to knock? He can just kick it. He can open it. He can just come in. He can just force us to do things. You know, people say, let God make me do this. Well, God will never make you do things. He needs your permission. He 
he he needs your permission he needs to he needs for you to say not my will my will be done like jesus said jesus had to decide on the cross to go to the cross in the garden of gethsemane he prayed there was a battle going on and he decided in the end not my will nevertheless not my will but thy will be done in other words he said lord let your will be supreme may your will be done not my will i take your will you have the permission to accomplish your will in my life now he is opening the door for god to come in through his determination through his will and through his mouth our prayers are basically giving permission to god to come into our life and intervene in our life in the affairs of our life to do what he wants to do in our life now some people say well god doesn't need my permission brother god can do whatever he wants well just think about how god respects man god made man in his image and likeness he wouldn't like anybody to barge into his door unnecessarily unwantedly and just force themselves into his life and make him do something he wouldn't want that he doesn't operate like that he doesn't live under such thing he made you and i just like him nothing less than that he made you and i just like himself what a honor god has given if god takes that away and if what some people are saying becomes the reality that god can just do whatever he wants with our life he can just take it and do it doesn't matter what we think or what we say or what we do god can just come in and take and do whatever he wants if that is true then i'll tell you my friend you will lose all your respect your your opinion is not needed at all at that point you cease to be a person at all you have no respect at all is that how we want to live i'll tell you my friend the bible teaches us the highest that the highest respect is given to man among all creations man is created in the image and likeness of god that god even god does not enter into our life without us opening the door he knocks at the door and if one if a man opens then he comes in can anybody today become be made a christian can be forced to become no cannot cannot only if that person says lord jesus you come into my life you be my lord so far i've been my lord and it's been a disaster so i want to stop being my lord i want you i want i want i want to i want to stop being my own lord i want you to be my lord i open my heart to you come in when you invite jesus he comes in otherwise he cannot when the devil wants to work in your life he has to have people's permission the permission comes by way of the mouth and the mind when a person opens the doors and gives a gap for the devil to enter in something has happened in his mind something is happening through his mouth that is why the devil finds a way to come in and do things thanks be to god who always god says us triumph in his name thanks be to god who always god says us to win yeah thanks be to god who always god says us triumph in his name thanks be to god thanks be to god we have overcome Thanks be to God, who always comes. 
says us triumph in his name. Thanks be God, who walks God, says us to win. Yeah. Thanks be God, who walks God, says us to triumph in his name. Thanks Clap be our hands God, and thanks be God, we have overcome. You're the one, hallelujah, hallelujah, the one who made a way for us to triumph in the name of the world, the world, the world, the The victory. We got the victory. Everything will be all right, all right. We got the victory. Everything will be all right. We're on the winning side. We got the victory. Everything will be all right, all right. We got the victory. Everything will be alright. Cause we're on the winning One more time. side. We got the victory. Everything will be alright, alright. We got the victory. Everything will be alright. Cause we're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. We have over. You're the one.